May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My fellow redeemed, you've been driving for hours and everyone's starting to get a little bit tired and their tummies are grumbling and you start to get a little temper flaring in the back seat and so you just need to stop and eat and rest and stretch your legs. So you begin to watch those road signs looking for a favorable exit, one that will have the kind of restaurant you need, one that you can go in and go out. You still have miles to go. Finally, you see just the right one. You pull off and you look and that first chain, its parking lot is full and there are cars wrapped all the way around the building. So you go to the next one, find the same thing. You go to the next one, you find the same thing and you begin to wonder, well, what do I do? Is it worth waiting for such mediocre food? What if I go back down the road? Will I find another place quickly enough? Maybe even find some place a little better? Is this worth the wait? It's your anniversary. And you have a sitter for the first time in who knows how long. You've been meaning to go to this restaurant that everybody is talking about. You got all dressed up. You got out the door on time. And when you get there, you have to squeeze your way to the hostess desk and you ask that question. How long's the wait? Oh. You exchange a glance. going to be worth the wait? Maybe it's for the best donut in Oregon, or the best prime rib, or a five-course meal prepared by a culinary genius. Maybe it's for a restaurant with the greatest view, or just one of those places that has the atmosphere you can't find anywhere else. Those are the kinds of places that not only are people willing to pay the top dollar, but they're willing to wait for hours to be able to enjoy that experience. But until you have, maybe you wonder, is it really worth that wait? Isaiah describes a feast prepared by the Lord of armies himself. Nothing but the finest will be served. He will spare no expense. And yet so many people will say, well, is it really worth it? Today, we hear the Lord's invitation again to come to his feast, to his banquet. And today, Isaiah reminds us how we can know that it's worth wait. On this mountain, that is, on the mountain of the Lord, the place where God comes down to meet with his people, on this mountain, Isaiah says, the Lord of armies will prepare a banquet for all people of rich food. But some of you might be saying, have you seen this place? I mean, the people of Judah weren't exactly keeping up the appearances. They had wandered away from the Lord. They were following false gods. They weren't a faithful people. You would be shocked at some of the things they did and said. And if you think they're bad, you should see all the people around them. The things that those heathen people were doing would make your skin crawl. How could God prepare a banquet in a place like that? I'm guessing I'm not the only one who remembers that as a child, there were times when you had to clean your house from top to bottom for company. And it wasn't just a little sweeping, a little bit of wiping things down or vacuuming or even mopping, but it had to be a deep cleaning. Places you knew no one would ever see had to be spotless. 
rooms no one would enter had to be tidied up. Everything had to be just perfect. And if you remember those kind of cleaning days, you remember how miserable it was for a kid to have to go through such an ordeal. But if it was miserable for us, imagine what it was like for all that dirt. After all, those dust bunnies were just getting comfortable in all of those corners. That grime was building its own civilization. That those microorganisms, they were just going about their business. The weeds, they were just setting down roots, so to speak, until someone came and pulled them all up, wiped them all away, scoured them to the bone, to the clean counter, and swept them all away into the trash. This world is such a mess. How can God host a banquet here? When we see the terrible things happening around in our own country or around the world, horrible cruelty, we wonder when is God going to come and do something about it? When we hear those stories that break your heart, we think God's got to sweep away this trash. When we look at how careless People can be, and the damage they do to God's beautiful creation and to one another, we think, well, God's got to scrub and wipe that clean. When we look at how evil the world is becoming, how our culture seems to infect everything around us, and we see people falling away, and we see how this culture begins to corrupt even our own hearts, we think to ourselves, God's got to wipe it clean. Get out the disinfectant soon, doesn't he? when we look closely at our hearts and we remember what that means, do we imagine that that sort of cleaning is easy or pleasant? Isaiah describes God's cleaning process and it isn't a pretty picture. He will prune every weed from the vineyard of his people. He will sweep away all the unfaithful from his holy city. He will scour every evil and mark of every sin. He will wipe and utterly destroy every wicked heart. There will be no merrymaking, no joy, no gladness in the streets. And Judah, Judah who had been unfaithful, who had followed so many idols, they would be caught up in it and they would feel that pain. They would go into exile. Their temple would be destroyed. God's city would be left deserted. And they would look around and they would wonder, what happened? When we read these sections of God's word that speak so much about his judgment, we wonder, what does that all mean? How are we supposed to understand it? And then Isaiah inserts these beautiful words of comfort in there to tell us that those things are God's preparation for a banquet. On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. You know, to my ears, that might sound a little bit like one of those mandatory fun days that superior officers would come up, from time, come up with from time to time to boost morale. And one thing that is true about every mandatory fun day is it's not much fun. Or perhaps it's like one of those parties that you feel you have to go to and out of an obligation or that wedding reception that you're checking your watch to see when you can most politely leave. For we all know those people that you can't even imagine that they could possibly throw a good party. Is God one of them? Isn't it sad how hard a time we have Imagining having a good time without having the, just the right amount of bad behavior mixed in. Perhaps that's what we see happening in the parable Jesus told in our gospel lesson. The master prepares this great banquet. He sends out the invitation, but the people go, Oh, that doesn't sound like my sort of thing. Uh, I, uh, I got a thing. I'm planning on being out of town this weekend. Or, uh, you know, I've got a project that I am just in the middle of that I, I can't 
just leave unfinished. Or, you know, I just want to stay at home and watch Netflix with my wife tonight. Thanks for the invitation, but I, I, just, I just can't. So much has sin clouded our eyes. God himself prepares the banquet. He prepares it with the best of the best. He has spared no expense. He has sent out the invitation, and yet to our ears, to our eyes, it can seem so ordinary. Like maybe it's really not our thing. Forgiveness, grace, word and sacrament, a life in heaven. Well, what about life right now? Don't we have more pressing business to attend to? Aren't there more important things we could be doing with our time? And that pressing question, how do we know that the pleasures we seek out and find and search for right here, right now on this earth, aren't worth missing out on God's banquet later on? As the song says, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners have much more fun. And yet God rebukes our foolish hearts. For he has shown us how these pleasures of this life, they never fully satisfy. The treasures we build up for ourselves and the things we think are so important, they don't last. He removes the veil from our eyes so that we can see that nothing we know, nothing we have experienced, nothing we have ever tasted begins to compare to what he is preparing for you. He is the Lord of armies who prepares this banquet, the one who has created every good thing, the one who gives every good thing. The one who removes everything that is bitter and distasteful and corrupt, he prepares a banquet. How can that disappoint? On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. But how can we enjoy a feast when so many troubles hang over us? Sometimes it's so hard to enjoy a little R&R &R or to savor one of those great moments of life. You're worried about things going on in your family and what your future might possibly hold. You have that unfinished business that's always nagging at the back of your mind and the deadline is pushing in on you. So how can you enjoy the time that you have right here and right now? You work so hard. And yet, sometimes you have so little to show for it. When money is tight and you try to enjoy life, well, then every dollar you spend seems to hang a dark cloud over you. Maybe you've entered a midlife or even later in life crisis. Yeah, things are good now, but how long is that going to last? I've got so much more I should have been doing. How much time do I have left? And over all these things, over all of life, death hangs. When you work towards a goal and you might even reach that goal and it doesn't satisfy you the way you thought it might, well, what was all that work for? Is this all there is to life? When someone near and dear to you dies, and their death hangs on your heart. How can there be any joy, any celebration, any banquet or feasting with tears and sorrow in your heart? God prepares a banquet. But he prepares that banquet in the light of his plan of salvation. At this banquet and on this mountain, Sorrow doesn't have a place at the table. 
Darkness cannot enter the room. Your troubles and your sorrows, they get left at the door. At this banquet and on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that covers all the peoples and the cloth woven over all nations. What is the shroud that hangs over all the peoples other than that shroud of sin? What is that cloth woven over all the people that confines them and holds them down other than the wages of sin, that is death? And so the Lord of armies prepares the banquet on this mountain. Because on this mountain, he fights the greatest battle. He wins the greatest war that has ever been fought. On this mountain, your Lord and Jesus Christ faced every cruel accusation on this mountain. He suffered every evil pain and disgrace on this mountain. He was condemned for your sins. Just outside this city, God's son hung on a cross. And not far away from this mountain, the lifeless body of the Lord of Armies was wrapped in cloth and laid in a cold tomb. And on this mountain, here, he rose again. And Isaiah proclaims this great joyous celebration. He has swallowed up death forever. Only here. Only on God's holy mountain. Only where God comes down to meet his people with his grace, with his life, with his forgiveness, with his joy. Can you enjoy these things without sorrow? Can you find joy without death hanging over it? Can you taste and see that the Lord is good? Only here is a world without death. Only here is a banquet you can truly enjoy. On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. I think only one excuse remains. It's not for me. Perhaps I should say it's not for someone like me. I'm not the kind of person who gets invited to important things like that. God would never want if all the other people at the banquet saw me there and they knew what I was like, they would certainly make sure that I got sent right out the door if God knew what was truly in my heart. And certainly he knows all of my hypocrisies. If God knew all of that, he would never invite me. He would never let me in his banquet. On this the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. I've probably said that, what, about ten times now? And yet, perhaps one of those phrases you didn't quite catch. Or, you know, it bounces off your ears or off our guilty, guilt-ridden heart. The Lord of armies prepares for all peoples. No one is kicked out for who they are. Because who they are is who God may, has made them to be. Who God has saved them to be. Who God has died for them to be. The redeemed children of God. God has gathered from all nations, from all peoples, those for whom Jesus has died, those for whom his invitation has gone out. And the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. And so your past wrongs, your past sufferings, your fears, and your worries, God tenderly takes them away from you. He will take away the shame of his people throughout the earth. The devil himself will have no accusation he can possibly make against you, for you have been clothed with Christ's righteousness by faith and through baptism. In Christ, you can say you belong in God's presence. And nothing can change that. 
Nothing can take it away, for as Isaiah says, the Lord has spoken. If you are hungry and tired enough, you might be willing to wait quite a while for a greasy fast food hamburger. If you have been waiting for this special night out with someone you care about, you're probably going to wait for the table and at least you'll have good company while you do. If you know that that meal is going to be the best meal you will ever eat, you can bet you're willing to wait to taste it. Prophecies often place more than one event side by side. And so it's true here. Judah got to taste a little bit of God's banquet when the Lord kept his promise and brought them back from their exile. The disciples and all those who sat with Jesus and heard his voice and ate at his table, they got to taste a little bit of God's goodness as they heard God's promises from God's mouth as they got to go to the empty tomb and see that he is not there. As they got to touch the risen Lord and he proclaimed to them, your sins are forgiven. They got to taste a little bit of that feast of joy on all those days. And they got to be then the joyful servants who got to go out and invite the nations to come to God's banquet. My dear friends, every time we gather together, God and God proclaims to you that you, your sins are forgiven. Every time another person is washed clean in those waters of baptism, every time you, your body and your soul are fed with Christ's body and blood in the sacrament, God's banquet is there for you. You get to taste a little bit of God's grace. You get to taste the joy that he has prepared for you. And you have nothing to fear. No excuses remain for he has washed you clean and scoured the sin from your heart. He has beckoned you to come to him and you know that he does not disappoint for he blesses you with so many good things in this life. You get to come to God's banquet. And you come to this banquet in the light of his salvation which can never be dimmed or taken away by the troubles and sorrows of this life. You get to be those who go out and invite to the highways and the hedges. Come to the feast of the Lord. And you know that no one will be excluded. And yet while we taste these things now, and we enjoy God's grace and his goodness right now, we also know that we look forward to the day, the day when we will taste them to the full, when all the sorrows, all the fears, all the worries, all the troubles, all the sins, all the grief, all the guilt will all be left behind. And then nothing will interrupt this meal. Nothing will turn its taste bitter in your mouth. On that day, you will experience a banquet of joy. And on that day, it will be said, surely this is our God. We wait for him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Please rise. Now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.